hungry. Some of you are going, that's true. They trained Ehud to be left-handed. Why? Because the Benjamites would go out into battle, and they would begin to battle right-handed. It reminds me of Rocky Balboa. Y'all ever seen that movie? You remember, Larry, you know what I'm talking about, brother? You know, he was a southpaw. You remember Rocky Balboa, Sylvester Stallone? And he goes out, and he's fighting Clubber Lang, Mr. T, you know, the big mohawk on here, you know? I'm going to bust you up. You remember that? <laughs> and, so, and so he fights the whole fight right-handed. And Mickey, you remember Mick, the guy with the little toboggan on? Burgess Meredith, he slams the mat and he goes, now, Rock, now! And Rocky goes to left-handed. Totally blew Clubber Lang's mind. And Sylvester Stallone, Rocky, laid him out. It's, it's fa fantastic. And this is what happened. The Benjamites played that game. They would go into war. They would begin right-handed, make a couple of moves, go to the left hand with the sword. Guy wasn't expecting it. And he's out. They were fierce fighters. But they had to train them. They had to, they had to train and pour into them from the time that they were young this idea of doing hard things. People that's old like me, what has trained you in your life? The easy stuff or the hard stuff? The hard stuff. And so often we think that we're doing our kids right by making it easier for them. Well, I just want them to have it easier than I had it. You're going to raise a bunch of pansies and a bunch of brats. I'm telling you, you've got to get to a place where a kid understands that you're not trying to be mean, but if you've got a garden, put a hoe in their hand. You know, you got a lawnmower and they're 15, put them on it. I mean, do you, do you remember how it was to work? I mean, used to, I would drive through my neighborhood when I was a kid with my, with my grandma or my grandpa and all the kids were out playing. You drive through neighborhoods now, nobody, no kids out playing. Kids don't play outside anymore. Why? They're on their phone. They're, they're, they, we don't, we, do, you know, do you understand the obesity problem we have in America today? Do you understand that 65% of 6th through 8th graders in America are considered obese? I bet you as a school teacher know that. It's frightening because they don't do anything. And it's not their fault. It's not their fault. They're kids. It's our fault. I grew up working in a chicken house. Anybody ever work in a chicken house? Oh, as Jerry Clower used to say. Oh, man. Somebody shoot up here in there amongst us. One of us got to have some relief. I'm telling you, working in a chicken house is hard work. And I worked in a chicken house before we had electric feeders. You fed them with a wheelbarrow. And we had these jugs that you watered them with. We didn't have these electric watering deals. We had these jugs with these screw-on red lids, and you flip that thing over, gravity fed, and you carry them things out when the Holly Farms back in the day, Holly Farms. You remember Holly Farms, anybody? Before Tyson? So you go, Holly Farms, who's that? I'm telling you. And I, I tell you, I worked in a chicken house from the time I was five years old, and I know some of the kids are going, yeah, I bet you walk to school uphill both ways in the snow too. <laughs> and my, my kids say that to me all the time. You know, Dad, you had it so hard. I'm glad I had it hard. It made me who I am. And I think about those times. Man, I ate good and I slept good, preacher. Because I worked. And I was proud to see that I'd help my grandfather line that entire chicken house with fresh sawdust. And I put all those jugs out. I did it. Papa, I got it. I got it. He was old. He was 70 years old. And he was working like a Trojan, bib overalls, doing all that he could. Never took a vacation. Just the hardest working man, sixth grade education. And I wanted my grandfather to be proud of me. And he was a hard man to please. One time he told me, though, as I was carrying, I was carrying four jugs. That was hard in each hand. It's one thing to do it with your strong hand, your dominant hand, right hand. I'm right-handed. It's another thing to do it left-handed. And I'll never forget as long as I live, I was walking down the chicken house, this long, 110-foot-long chicken house, and Grandpa, I heard him say, Son, you're stout. Some of the young people don't even know what that means. It means strong. I stood up straighter. I just felt like going putting the jugs down going dun 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 <laughs> I was Cam Newton you know I'm Superman <laughs> hey grandparents do you know what it means when your grandchild hears from you that you're proud of them 
and you love them and you appreciate them. Look, I was like 10 or 11 years old and I still remember that. I remember where I was standing in the chicken house when my grandfather said that to me. And mom and dad, it's okay to tell your kid, I love you. Even if they've done nothing. You say, I love you. They make mistakes. They do dumb things. But they need to hear it. I love you. Daddies, your little girls need to hear, I love you. Dads, do you know how girls are stimulated by what they hear? Dads, you know how we're stimulated? By what we see. By what we see. Little girls need to hear from their daddies. I love you, pumpkin. I love you, honey. Katie, my oldest daughter, my nickname for her is Kate. I love you, Kate. To this day, she's 24 years old. Candace, my daughter who's soon to be 21, I call her Can Can. Clara, my 13 year old, my name for her is Cucka because that's what Charlotte, my granddaughter, calls her Cucka. Andrew is Drew Boy. He's Drew Boy. That's just, do you have names? And they'll carry these names. I, I'll tell Andrew I love him. I'll say, Drew Boy, I love you. And he'll say, Feed my sheep. <laughs> <laughs> you know when jesus said that to peter do you love me because i pre i just preached that message not long ago and, and so andrew does that and i say drew boy i love you just feed my sheep <laughs> but he'll remember that he'll remember that training is not easy did you know that we are disciples of christ anybody in here saved you're a disciple of christ do you know what the root for disciple is? It's the same root that's found in discipline. Discipline. Do your kids have to do chores? Do they have some chores that they have to do? Do they have to make their bed? It's a good thing. Can they run the dishwasher? Do you wash all of their clothes for them, Mama? What, are you a maid? I mean, she's 14. Like I said, he's 15. He knows how to program the DVR. I guarantee you he can turn the dishwasher on. Do they know how to run the washing machine? Oh, they'll ruin the clothes. Not if you teach them. Not if you teach them. I mean, good Lord, they're 15 years old, people. They're learning biology in high school. Surely they can separate the dark from the whites. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I mean, they're taking chemistry. They've learned that potassium is K, right? Haven't you learned that on periodic chart of elements, right? And if they know that potassium is K, they can separate the clothes. It's okay. And they'll load the dishwasher wrong and they'll burn some plastic. But every time you smell the burning plastic, you'll know they tried. <laughs> Gara trained his son and it was hard. Do you expect your children to do hard things? I'm not talking about academics and athletics. We talked about that last night. I'm just talking about helping out around the house. Your house is an economy. Your home is an economy. See, my, the brown house is an economy. And there are certain expectations I have for my kids. People ask me all the time, do you give your kids an allowance? Yeah, I allow them to eat in my house. I allow them to sleep in my house. I say man you're mean no I'm not they have opportunities to earn some money we, we've got a cleaning job we clean a business and and we we let we allow them to earn some money but they that's when they're putting on the rubber gloves cleaning toilets they're, they're working I mean I don't just give it to them you go well you're not very no, there no, listen there's times that I'll give my kids things even 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 if they haven't earned it I'm not that kind of person but I just believe that we've got to raise kids with an understanding that doing things that are that are difficult is actually a good thing it truly is look at verse 16 and Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges okay now what's he getting ready to do this guy has been trusted with the ability to take all of the tax money down to Eglon. Moab was in the south. It was below the Dead Sea. Okay? They're in the hill country of Ephraim. Ephraim is in between the Dead Sea area and the Sea of Galilee. You know that little dot on your maps in the back of your Bibles? So you've got the Sea of Galilee up north, 
You go about 90 miles south, you got the Dead Sea. Right in the middle is the area of Ephraim, kind of in the area of Samaria. Moab is way down here below the Dead Sea. So here's this man Ehud, and he's been entrusted, and he's a young man, it appears. He's been entrusted with the ability to take all this tax money down to Moab, down to Eglon, the king. So what kind of guy is Ehud? One who is very trusted, very well respected. By the way, the money that they're taking down, hundreds, fifties, twenties, and tens, no. It's all coins. It's very heavy. It's, very, it's, a, it's a lot of it. So he's got help to do it. Let's keep reading. So he makes for himself a Okay, so now he's making a sword. Now this sword is a dagger. It's about 18 inches long. Now watch what he does with it. It's a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. Hey, guys, why is right thigh? He's left-handed. He's left-handed. Got it? So now he's armed, okay? He's packing, okay? And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, I love this part. I just love the Bible. Now, Eglon was not just a fat man. He was a very fat man. <laughs> Think of Jabba the Hutt. I mean, a slob. He's a disgusting king. Verse 18, And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. So Ehud had all this help carrying all this money, this tax money, and now he sends them all away. Ehud's got a plan. But he himself, verse 19, turned back at the idols near Gil Gilgal. So Gilgal is this area where the Moabites kept all their idols. It reminds me of the Areopagus back in Mars Hill when Paul went there and they had all the gods, you know, and he said, let me tell you about the unknown god. You remember that? It reminds me of that. He said, I have a... Now, I love this. Ehud says, hey, king, I've got a secret message for you. And the king commanded silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. Now, now watch this play out. Ehud says, hey, king, I've got a secret message from you for, for you. And the king goes, silence, everyone out. Why do you want everyone out? He didn't want anybody. He, he's so pompous and arrogant and prideful. He was the only one that wanted to hear. It seems that he had some trust in Ehud. This probably isn't Ehud's first rodeo. He's been there before to bring the tribute. And so, to some degree, he trusts this guy, this foreigner bringing this tribute. He's out! Everyone out. So, who's left? Let's do the math. <laughs> Ehud and Eglon. Eglon, what a name. Eats too many eggs. I don't know what his problem is. But he's very fat. Now, watch this. Verse 20. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. Now, we need to stop there for a moment. Palaces back in that day were built with two stories. They had a ground floor story that was just like this room. This room is, is your sanctuary, okay? But in those days for the king, or a king's palace, this would be the greeting hall. This is where the dignitaries would come. And up here would be like where the pulpit is. This is where the king's throne would be, okay? Y'all have seen this in movies. You know, they come down the long walk and they come before the, you know, think of Wizard of Oz. You know, here they come, Dorothy and the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and... You know, here they all are up there. The second floor was the home of the king. And they called it the cool roof chamber because it was up there that you could get the cool breezes and, of the evening and so forth. So, so his room was up there. So apparently, remember, Ehud had brought the tribute money, okay? Then he had left, and then he sent his other fellows back, back home, and then he turns around and come back, comes back. Well, the, by the time he comes back, Eglon... I mean, I, can you see him getting up? Oh, I'm going up to the top floor. And I don't know how long it took him, no elevators, but eventually he got up there. So he's up there on the second floor. He's in the cool roof chamber. Now, now watch. And Ehud said, so now they're upstairs. Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. There he is, job of the hut, standing up again. It's, it's almost like I can see Ehud almost looking around. Like he's still wanting to whisper it to him. It's like he lowered his voice. I have a message.
message. For you came. So the king stood up. And so now Ehud is right there in front of him. You know what's going to happen, don't you? Some of you read ahead. What? Watch this. Keep her, this is great. That ought to make this into a movie. And Ehud reached with his left hand. He took the sword from his right thigh and he thrust it into his belly. <laughs> and the hilt also. What's the hilt? The handle went in after the blade and the fat. I told you he was very fat. Closed over the blade for he did not pull the sword out of his belly. Oh my word. And the dung came out. This is, this is in the Bible? It is. Ehud went out into the porch and he closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. Can you see him doing that? Closes the doors. How's he going to get out? How's he going... I read this years ago and I thought, how's he going to get out? The Bible says that Verse 23, then Ehud went out into the porch and he closed the doors of the roof chamber and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the roof chamber. Now, so what is the closet of the roof chamber? The bathroom. Okay, I'm sorry, there's no indoor plumbing there. Not in the way that we would know it. There's a hole in the floor. And it drops down, you know. And... Now watch, verse 25. And they waited till they were embarrassed. Who waited? The servants. They thought he was relieving himself in the closet. Remember what? I mean, not to be, not to be gross here, but, but it doesn't smell good in there. Because remember, the, the dung has come out. Okay? And so they're, they're thinking, he's in there using the bathroom. I mean, what's the, now watch. And they waited until they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor. Verse 26, Ehud escaped while they delayed. How to get out? I told you a moment ago that one of the things we've got to teach our kids to be willing to do is to do hard things. How did he get out? Some of you don't want to say it. He literally went down the toilet. And those palaces where those holes were for the king, for in his family, they would have a clean out door. Just a magic septic clean out door, a small door that was usually on the back side of the palace. And they would, servants, I don't know who had that task, but would go in and clean out the, the urine and the dung and so forth. Did Ehud have a plan? Oh, yeah. I think he had planned this a long time ago. The entire nation of Israel has been under the bondage of this king for how long? 18 years. And Ehud got to the place that he had had enough. That he said, this is wrong and this is not going to continue. Now watch what he does. And he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sederah. He's going back north. And when he arrived, he, watch, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. That's where he's from. Can, can you hear the trumpet? This is, this, is, this is like a ram's horn, you know. And there was a certain sound, sounds that you would make for call to arms, for, for victories, for, for whatever the case might be. And so he sounded, listen, he, sound, he sounded the trumpet. Then the people of Israel went to him from the hill country. And he, notice the singular personal pronoun he was their leader for 18 years they've just been giving money and paying tribute to this fat guy 
And now finally one person, one man stands up and says, I'm going to do something about it. And we're going to fight this guy. And he was their leader. And he said to them, Ehud, follow after me. For the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. That's all he said. I was just, mount up. Mount up. Charge. And they went. How do you think Ehud smelled? Somebody probably looking at Ehud and be going, right there, what's wrong with God? Man, he's, he's got this all over him. He's, did he take time to go home and change clothes? No. This, he's on a mission. He's on a mission. Faith, Adam, I was listening to y'all sing. Y'all practiced, spent some time together. You worked on it. I can tell it was good. That's just not something you just do. When it means something, this is one of the Acafellas. When it means something, you work on it. Right? You work on it. And so here's Ehud. This, this young man, he goes, let's go. And so they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan. And this is the area where the, the, uh, the Jordan River, it, it kind of, it's where you could cross it. That's what a ford is. It's where you could ford the river. And watch. And they did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel. Notice it says hand of Israel. I would have thought it would have said hand of Ehud. But now it's the whole nation. It's now the whole nation. One young man. Papa, Papa, it hurts, Papa. Papa, untie my arm, Papa. Ehud, I love you, honey, but I'm training you. You don't understand now, but I'm training you to be a great man of God. I know you hurt. Come here, come here. I love you. It's going to be okay. Don't you know Gara cried? It hurts, Papa. It hurts. It's okay. It's okay. Man, it's hard to do that, isn't it, Mom and Dad? Because we, we don't want our kids to hurt. I've taken my kids to, with me to Ethiopia. I've taken them to places where literally I've been in the villages where they've never seen a white person. They looked at me and thought I was a freak of nature. Those little kids came running up to me and they were rubbing my hand thinking they're going to rub down to the black, right? I said, I said, no, 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 no. And they, they thought I was some sort of God because I had white skin. I said, no, 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 no. Look, look, look. It's just skin. It's a paint job. And I had, I had a translator. And I said, translate, translate. They speak they, 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 the Ethiopian language. And, and he was translating. I said, I said, paint job, like car. Like car, like Ford, like a Ford car, like a Chevy car. They have them in white and blue and red, but you pop the hood and the engines are the same. See, you pop the hood, you open up my chest. You can't tell if my heart's a white heart, a black heart, a, a Mexican heart, an Asian heart. Same thing with, with anyone in this room. Because we're all created in God's image. See, it's just a paint job. That's all it is. But, I, but going to Ethiopia is hard. And I took my oldest daughter when she was 13. And then I took Candace when she was 15. And they both got sick on the trip. Candace got sick the third night that we were there. And she said, Daddy, why did you do this to me? I mean, we were so far from home. We flew. It, took a, it literally take, it took us two and a half days to get where we were going by the time we left the United States. Some of you don't been on mission trips. You know it takes so long to travel there. It was a 14-day trip, and we, we flew into Addis Ababa. Then we drove six hours down to a place called Alaba Kalito, and then we went out into the villages, and we stayed at a church. Man, it was, I slept in a pup tent, in a, and I curled up like in the fetal position because Walmart don't make a tent my size, okay? I'm just telling you. 
and, and you could hear the mice rubbing against the outside of the tent in the night. They told us to take earplugs. Now I know why. I plugged my ears. It was driving me crazy. That was hard for my kids. You know what they tell me all the time now when they face hard things in their lives? They go, that's it's cool. I've been to Ethiopia. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Have you done something hard? I mean, I'll tell you things that's, that's kind of hard. It's just going camping. Just take your kids camping. Just do something out of the ordinary. You know, just cook a meal on a, on a, you know, just build a fire and cook a meal. You know, sleep when it's uncomfortable, right? You know, I mean, just do something that's hard. Go hike a mountain. Go do something. Do, and you know what the kids will remember? Yeah, they'll remember Disney. They'll remember all that stuff. But they'll remember those hard things. You know, my kids have been to Disney a couple of times, actually. Kudos for me. But my kids, they never talk about Disney. You know what they talk about? Ethiopia, being sick. Middle of the night, Katie, uh, Candace is throwing up. She's the one that's getting married in April. She's throwing up. Daddy, I want to go home. I want to go home. I said, honey, you, you, we can't get there from here. <laughs> we just, there's no way. I mean, we, we, we rode in on an Isuzu Trooper, okay, bouncing around till we got to a goat path. And then we, we put on backpacks and we hiked two miles. You can't get there from here. I'm telling you. I said, baby, you're going to be okay. You see, the thing with all kids, the, until they're pushed to the limits, you don't know what they're made of. And Candace said to me, I kept holding her hair back, and she was literally throwing up in a bowl like that. I kept holding her hair back. She had the stomach bug. Because sometimes when you go on those foreign trips, you eat the food and you try to do the best. You don't drink the water and you don't eat the fruit. But even though they cook the food, you can, it's just your stomach's not used to You know what I'm saying? It's just rough. And so I knew she'd get through it because I've been through it. And I knew she'd get through it. And it was hard. She goes, why did you do this to me? I hate you. I cried with her. But I knew it would pass. That morning, right before the sun came up, I heard her calling. And so, you know how this is when you get the stomach bug? About every 30 minutes, it, it rolls around again. You feel good after you throw up. You're like, oh, I think I'm okay. And then it, you feel it coming again, right? <laughs> so I, and so I dozed back off on my little cot. Daddy, daddy. And I, I ran back over, and I, go, I, and I got the bowl, and she goes, no, no, it's okay. And she had a smile on her face. I said, what? She says, it's going to be okay. She said, look. And I looked, and out this little window that we could see out in this little place we were in, the sun was starting to come up. She said, Daddy, morning's coming. She said, Daddy, in fact, I wrote it down, and I want to quote exactly what she said to you. She said, Daddy, I know now Jesus is real. I know him. He helped me last night. I'd never heard her say that. She prayed to receive Jesus right before her fifth birthday. We tried to talk her out of it. Until she told me this, Pastor. She said, Daddy, if I were to die tonight, I would go to hell. You've got to help me know Jesus. Okay, okay, we'll do that. We'll pray together. And we did. But I worried about Candace's salvation. Because she was given a lot of lip and a lot of back talk. I mean, she turned 12 and 13, and that's when I started losing my hair. I'm telling you. My first kid, Katie, compliant. The first one usually is. Didn't ever give. I'm telling you. If we'd had Candace first, probably wouldn't have had a second one. You know what I'm saying? I love Candace. My can-can. But I'm telling you, she is tough. But the thing I've learned about kids, if you can get a strong-willed child like that steered in the right direction, nobody's moving them. Nobody. And so for Candace, my strong-willed child, I knew she needed something hard in her life. She bucked me for all it was worth. She did not want to go to Ethiopia. She, had, she was telling people at church, and they were saying, you know, your daughter don't want to go to Ethiopia. I mean, making me feel rotten. And I'm like, I finally just got ticked off with Candace. I said, Candace, you're going. And I said, because you need to go. 
I mean, I was like Gera. Changed her life. Candace marks her life now by Ethiopia. I'm not saying anybody, well, I've got to go to Ethiopia. I'm just saying, think of, think of something that you can do that's going to mark time in your kid's life. Sometimes it's a, it's a camping trip or something of that sort. Something where you get away. You've got to get away from the technology. You've got to get away from it. Take them fishing. Do something. But build that rite of passage in their life, that expectation in their life. I believe that's what was done here by Gera. Now, a couple other things were going to be done. I've got two minutes to do this. I want to share some things that might be of encouragement to you. Mom and Dad, you have to debrief your kids. You have to debrief your kids. As good as our school teachers are, once they get into high school and all, they're not going to necessarily get a godly worldview. Because as good as our high school teachers are around here, they still have to teach evolution. They have to teach it because it's the curriculum. Do you believe that we got here by a big bang in space from goo to you? Huh? Who created us? God. See, and I used to believe, well, God could have used evolution to have done that. But then Adam would have had to have been a caveman. Me, man. Eve, you woman. No, Adam was created in the image of God. He was perfect, perfect DNA. You know, just 11 generations removed was Noah. How smart was Noah? He built the ark, right? So you understand that our, our brain capacity and the ability to learn and to understand started out here. And if you go to Walmart about 2 o'clock on an afternoon, you'll see now we're down about right here. <laughs> if you can find somebody that's actually got clothes on and not your pajama pants. <laughs> I mean, because, look, we, we started out with Adam, and then we dropped down, and we got into the, you know, the Middle Ages. You know, you say, well, what about cavemen? What about cavemen? There are men that lived in caves. I don't believe in cavemen. I don't. You know, the, all, the, all the supposed cavemen that's taught about in our schools, you know, Cro-Magnon man, Peking man, Java man, they're all apes. You know, they came up with a Nebraska man back in 1953. You know how they drew an entire... Look up Nebraska man, Google Nebraska man. You know, they drew an entire picture of what Nebraska man looked like. Face looked like an orangutan, the whole nine yards. You know what they had to do it by? A tooth. You know what they finally did the, the testing on the tooth? It's a pig's tooth. There's an agenda out there. The agenda is to explain away God. Because if God didn't create us, you have to have a way for us to have gotten here. And that would be a big bang. From goo to you. It makes no sense to me. It takes more faith to believe that I came from a bang in space 13.2 billion years. Or was it 13.1 billion years? Well, who's counting, right? Right? I saw something the other day on Fox News that talked about these jellyfish that have been around for 500 million years. What if it was 501 million years? How do they know? You know what I'm saying? People, we make guesses all the time. I'm not anti-science. I'm just telling you that I, I've, teach, I've taught my kids to think with an objective mind, to think things through. You cannot marry the Bible with so much of what's being taught today. And it's not, the, it's not the teacher's fault. It's what's coming out of the curriculum houses. That's what. And, and remember, there's always an agenda. There's always a worldview. There's a worldview on the Discovery Channel. Do you believe CNN has a worldview? Do you believe Fox News has a worldview? Of course. So does the Weather Channel. The Weather Channel's worldview is that we are all destroying the earth. I like the Weather Channel. I love Jim Cantore. Don't ever be where he is because it's bad. But we've all got a worldview. So mom and dad, see, your kid is raised in your home, but they don't necessarily have your worldview. Because by and large, most of us aren't teaching our kids. Because we've only got three hours a day, and we're spending a lot of that time doing stuff for ourselves or stuff that they're doing. And so their worldview is coming from Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, their friends at school, right? Their teachers, their coaches. And they've got good teachers and coaches, I'm sure, but they might not all be believers. You see? So you have to debrief them. So many parents will tell me after their kids go off to college and they come back for that first break. They come back for fall break. They've only been gone for about five weeks. And sometimes parents just come to me with their eyes as big as saucers and they go, my kid is now professing they don't believe anything I've taught them for 18 years. Had a college professor, I won't name where, that told me one time, he's a very liberal man, not a believer at all. 
He said, give me your kids for about six weeks and I will change their minds. You've had them for 18 years, give them to me for six weeks because they think I'm the expert because I've got a Ph.D. Mm -hmm. So what you think, what you say, Mom and Dad, you got to debrief. Do they actually believe what you believe? Talk to them. And when do you talk to them? When do you talk to kids? You go, I have no clue. I'll tell you when you talk to kids. When you are dead dog tired, when it's about 1030 at night, they become vulnerable, they become open, they are ready to talk, and you're ready to go to bed. <laughs> and can I get a witness? Right. Listen, listen, listen. Listen to me. I'm being serious now. Talk to them then. Talk to them then. That's when they're going to share their heart. Don't let them be like the girl in the video. Walk past the guy. And he's on his iPad making money, living in that big house. You talk to them when they're ready to talk. I tell you, if you got on the next day, take two pics and prop open your eyelids. Do it. I mean, it'll be worth it. And they'll remember. They'll remember you sitting on the foot of their bed. And it's 1230 at night. And you know the clock's going off at 545. And you don't worry about it. And you don't lay some guilt trip on them saying, Do you know how early I got to get up? That's me walking to school both ways in the snow 10 miles, right? They don't want to hear that. They just want to know you care. And how do kids spell love? T-I-M-E. Give it to them. Give it to them. And they'll come tell you anything. The things they're struggling with, the things that they might not, you would you think, my kid would never tell me something like that. Why? Why do we expect our kids to go tell a coach or a teacher and not tell a parent? Well, don't, don't you want your kid to be able to tell you anything at any time? Yes. And then work through it. It may be something horrible, but, but work through it with them. That's part of the job. We work through it. And you still love them, no matter what it is. And then that love will conquer the, all of those things. Oh, that's, that's where God's mercy and grace just covers the, 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 the whole process. And they go, man, I just told my mom and dad something horrible. And they still love me. Yes, you're our kid. Of course we're going to love you. But if we're going to raise up champions, we've got to do those hard things. Are there any Ehuds in the room? Any young people that want to be like Ehud? Adam, Faith, you want to? It's not going to be easy. You want to read your Bible? You want to begin to put the thing? You know, Ehud, he made his own sword. His daddy didn't make his sword. Do you, you notice that? He did it. He owned his own faith. At some point, you don't write on mom and daddy's faith. It's yours. And you own it. And you make your sword. And you live life. And mom and dad, to get them to the place that they can make their own sword and own their own faith, we have to be willing to do the hard things. I want to close by doing something strange, and you may kick me out and may never have me come back, but I want to ask the kids in the room from the age of 10 years old to the age of 18 to do something for me. I want you to stand in your chair, just like me. Go. Go. 10 to 18, stand in your chair. Go. 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 Adam, how old are you? Stand up anyway. Faith, how old are you? Stand up. Stand up. Y'all look younger than that. Stand up. Okay. 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 How odd does this feel? Pretty odd, right? This is what it means to stand out in the crowd. This is what it means to be Ehud. You don't care. You don't care what everybody else is doing. You, don't, it's, it's, you get past the peer pressure. And you say, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to do it. I don't care what anybody says about me. I don't care what they tweet about me. I don't care what they say about me on Instagram. I'm willing to do it because it's the right thing to do. I'm going to live for the, for the king. I'm going to be a child of God. And so here we stand. It starts to get comfortable up here, doesn't it? And you know what? Eventually people start looking at you and there's, there may be some others that look in the room and if there were other kids here, if we, if we, I was just looking to see if we had any, like maybe a four-year-old or something. Because the truth is, and I've done this in many churches, they still ask me to come, Pastor. But <laughs> the four-year-olds sometimes will say to mom and dad, I want to do that. They just need an Ehud. Be an Ehud. Be, look at me, girls. Be an Ehud. Be an Ehud. Be an Ehud. Make up your mind. Get in the Word of God. Do the right thing. 
Let people see what you're made of, that you're following Christ. Can we give them a hand, church? Can we give them a hand? Here's what I feel led to do tonight, if you'll allow me this, Pastor. I feel led tonight. I'm, I'm not even, uh, I've gone long. It's 8.08. But I've just, I've, I, listen, I, I, every church I go into, I don't feel this liberty. Y'all are hungry. Y'all, y'all are a sponge. You're taking this in. I don't, I don't think I've even seen anybody look at your watch. Y'all, y'all are like, okay, we're, we, and, and we're, t- and look, when I preach, oftentimes it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. <laughs> I get that. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. But I've prepared hard so that I can, I can just, there's so much I want I to just give. Not that I'm, I'm some expert. I'm not. But I just, I, I just love people. I love these kids. Larry, I love you, but I really love Faith. You know? Because, the, and Adam, these guys, y'all, y'all are, y'all are going to make it happen. So much of our generation that we've blown it. We've gotten lazy. But your generation, you're willing to do hard things. I believe that. I believe that. So I encourage our young, all these young people that were in here, not that it's anything wonderful, but grab a copy of my book out there. It's free to you. These young girls, grab a copy of Katie's book. And, and I want to close tonight by praying. Would you stand with me? And, and, if, and I'm going to turn it over to the pastor, and I'm not going to dismiss you. He'll do that. But, but instead of having an invitation and having you come forward, we, we could do that. But I don't, I don't feel that was this kind of message. I feel like this kind of message was a message of encouragement, almost a message like a coach would give in a locker room, right? Team, are we ready? That's how, how we feel like. We put all of our hands in the middle, hands in the middle. So, so I know this is weird, but you'll remember me. You'll say, we ain't never having them back. So I need everybody to move towards me that can, and we're going to put our hands in the middle, okay? All right, we're a team. Come on, come on. Just try to come on and get in here. Hands in the middle. Come on. Come on. Come on, state girl. Come on, state girl. Come on. Hands in the middle. I got the, I got the pastor's son back here. He's a Carolina man. He's, okay. All right, now if you can't reach your hands to the middle, put your hand on the back of the person in front of you, okay? Because I don't want us to all fall over like dominoes, okay? Now I'm going to offer a prayer to the Lord. It won't be long because I don't want you to fall over, okay? Just take 15 seconds. You ready? Bow your heads. Let's pray. Father, you see this group of people. You see Maplewood Baptist right here. Father, make us into Ehud's. Make us into men and women that will do the hard things to be what you've called us to be, victors, warriors. We ask it in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen Amen. and amen. Amen. So go back to your seats for a moment and and your pastor will share a couple of things, I'm sure. And thank you so much. What a blessing, Kevin. Tomorrow night, he's going to be sharing from Luke and Hebrews about looking into the heart and going beyond just the behavior. Tomorrow night, we're going to be blessed with special music from Larry and Kay. I encourage you to think of those who you'd like to bring and invite them to come at 645. And we'll look forward to being together. Don't forget to pick up one of those books, one of those red bags. Most of all, continue to pray. God's mildly at work. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go in his peace.